Hey everyone, welcome to Tent Talk, the farmer's market podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. This week, our guest is Devin Van Noble, pig farmer at Van Noble Farm, farmer's market vendor, and new farmer educator in the Finger Lakes area of New York. Hey, everyone. I'm one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I'm a longtime farmer's market manager, vendor 101 co-teacher, and education coordinator at Farmer's Market Pros. And I'm Cap Fields-White, director of San Diego Markets, still an active farmer's market manager and consultant, founder of Farmer's Market Pros, and host of Intense, the farmer's market conference, coming right up, and the Farmer's Market Pros community. And I'm Justine marzoni Mead, Tent Talk producer, marketing director for Farmer's Market Pros, and logistics coordinator for Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference, which is coming up so fast. Ah. Yikes. Ah. <laughs> I mean, yay. Yay. We're excited. <laughs> We're excited. And busy. Yeah. <laughs> Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is supported by American Farmland Trust, protecting farm and ranch land and helping foster a new generation of farmers. Your membership keeps farmers farming, and that means healthy food and a better climate for all of us. Find American Farmland Trust at farmland.org, or click their logo on the resource page at farmersmarketpros.com. Welcome back to Tent Talk, everyone. Today we are talking with Devin Van Noble of Van Noble Farm in Trumansburg, New York. Devin raises, roasts, cures, and sells his pork products at the Ithaca Farmer's Market and at his on-farm butcher shop, and also caters special event pig roasts. When he's not farming, he's teaching future farmers as agricultural program coordinator at the Groundswell Center for Local Food and Farming in Ithaca. Welcome to Tent Talk, Devin. Hey there. Hey. You sound busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sound like us. A lot yeah. of different job descriptions. <laughs> lots of titles there. Yeah, lots of titles in there, for sure. You're our people. Uh, well, Devin, why don't you start by just giving us a little kind of professional uh, and personal background. You're a Florida native, so tell us how you ended up as a pig farmer in New York. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I ended up in New York by way of Cornell originally. Um, I grew up in Clearwater, Florida, uh, mostly fishing on the beaches and um, just, you know, doing the typical high school life, uh, sports, and et cetera, um, but had very little connection with the land or farming because I lived in a, a concrete jungle of sorts. Uh, so I came to Cornell for um, summer program originally, and then did my undergrad in biology and society, um, studying mainly agricultural uh, and agriculture in the environment. And um, I stuck around for a bit and then soon left to go to Vermont Law School, where I uh, did a program in environmental law and policy. And that is around the time when I, I really realized that I wasn't going to move further into the policy realm and, and wanted to get more um, close up with my farming community. And I hadn't hadn't landed uh, anywhere yet, but I ended up coming back to Ithaca. And, and um, yeah, one thing led to another, and, and I stayed. Wow. That's, a, that's an unusual adventure. path. Yeah. I like that path, though. Kinda yeah, it's like great. A little it's full awesome. circle. It sounds like you have a nice background for what you're doing. So when did you decide to venture off on your own and start Van Noble Farm? How did that come about? Like, just well, it was an out. It, it definitely uh, was kind of serendipitous. It was not a planned venture by any means. And in fact, I recall in the early days, I would explain to people that I had uh, thought it was very surprising that I honestly was able to um, maintain and and to launch a, a livestock business. Just it being so foreign to me as a Floridian and as a suburbanite. Um, it, it was a matter of uh, originally getting involved with the incubation program at the Intervale Center in, in Burlington originally, um, and then coming to Ithaca and getting involved with the Groundswell Center through the, the incubator program that we launched um, as part of my role. Um, and that was exposure that allowed me to connect with a broad network of farmers in, in the 
Tompkins County region and, and Finger Lakes in general. Um, and one of those farms that I connected with, I uh, got a job with the Piggery Farm, which is fairly well known in the Northeast um, as a, a pasture raised, um, originally fair to finish um, life, a pig farm that was also a butcher shop in it and, and was widely spread throughout co-ops and, and various grocers throughout the Northeast. Um, and so originally started as an employee with them and then uh, managed to get a contract for live animals through them and was um, given the opportunity to get started that way. And, and without that, uh, it probably would have been many more years before I would have decided to launch. That's great. That's amazing. Did you, are you, did you purchase your land? Are you on land? Um, yeah, not originally, but now I have. I, I have been in, on my new farm since 2016, but I originally started by renting um, about 40 acres and three livestock barns in, in the same town, um, but uh, a couple miles away and stayed there renting for close to five years and um, and then moved off and, and was able to purchase, uh, certainly with the help of, of family, um, was not able to just purchase based on my farming income. Um, but, but yeah, that's so great. I'm on my own farm now. How, that's awesome. How um, big is your farm now that you own your land? We have uh, 43 acres, um, again, in, in Trumansburg. And thankfully, I feel very blessed to have ended up on the farm that I did because uh, we looked at a number of properties that were much more marginal. Um, and this one is 25 acres of, of hay fields and pastures that we've, uh, you know, some parts of converted into grazing lands and parts of are still hayed and parts of we raise vegetables on. Um, so it, it was really a prime property to do what we were trying to do. That's so, great. So what was, what was your initial kind of plan for your own farmland? Did you always want to sell at farmer's markets? Was that a part of the original plan or were you just going to do um, kind of selling off wholesale? How did you kind of start that plan? Yeah, I, definitely um, for the first five years, I, as I said, I, I was a wholesale contract. I had one customer, um, this one butcher shop, again, the piggery that I worked with and that, um, that felt really good for the time being. It was uh, a much larger operation. We had probably between 200 and 250 pigs on the farm at a time. And um, they were mostly pasture raised. I mean, in the winters they stayed in barns for sure, but uh, they were all outside and we were, you know, rotationally grazing regularly. So it was a, a lot of work. Uh, I put blood, sweat and tears into that operation. Um, and, it was it was fortuitous that uh, the contract ended up getting canceled eventually, um, not out of any fault of my own, but as a result of their own business decisions. And um, and actually, the the piggery business was sold, uh, and the new owners ended up canceling some contracts. So um, that really forced me to pivot, and um, I was not sure if the business was going to survive that transition. Um, that was the same year that I purchased the farm, um, purchased my new farm. And yeah, we had big plans of putting up um, large livestock barns and, and continuing to grow wholesale. And uh, it became clear in that first six months that that wasn't going to be the reality and I needed to find something new. So um yeah, we, we turned to a whole new direct marketing strategy, which it, in, in large part was around uh, pig roasts and catering, um, but then has grown to an interest in butchering and selling direct retail products as well. Wow, that must have been scary, right? Yeah, there. It sounds like a tough <laughs> right? year. Oh, I've got my own big farm, and uh, okay, we're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and also uh, coincidentally, the same time frame, roughly, I also. Uh, stepped down from my job at Groundswell, which was my salary that was really paying the bills. And so a number of, a number of uh, financial factors uh, kind of coincided. And, and yeah, it was a, a year of uncertainty. And um, again, I, I don't think that there's uh, much question that without some, um, some privilege and some family backing that I wouldn't would have weathered that year. Um, 
uh, but I have, I feel like made a successful transition to this direct marketing strategy and, and we feel really good about the progress we've made in the past five years. That's great. So, um, talking a little bit more about that transition. So how, how is your operation impacted now that you sell at the farmer's market and you're selling direct instead of wholesale? Well, I've, again, I, I think I look at it as a, a blessing in disguise at the time. I didn't, I wasn't happy about it and I was frustrated and concerned, but, um, it has allowed me, uh, to be much more creative in what I'm doing with my product and what I'm doing on the farm. Um, and that being that I've also been able to sustain a, a very modest, but a small vegetable plot and, um, donate a lot of those vegetables and to work with the training programs through Groundswell that I work with now as a host farmer and to uh, take on a pair of draft horses and to start learning that um, that trade. And, and so there's a number of, of avenues that I wouldn't have pursued had it been that I stayed in the wholesale game. So um, yeah, it's allowed me a lot more creativity and that's been exciting. How about financially? Financially, I think it's a more sustainable pathway. I mean, given, you know, standing on one contract by itself is never a good feeling. And there was, you know, and it was a fixed price. And so, um, you know, grain prices go up, you have to renegotiate pricing with your, with your butcher and, and it's not always an easy conversation. They're, they're struggling just as much as the farmers are in a lot of cases. And so, um, it never felt very sustainable. And, and so now that we've, you know, we've developed the brand, we've, we've got a following, we've got a good customer base for weddings and for our special events and the word of mouth in the, you know, Tompkins County and, and within the Finger Lakes more broadly has spread about our business. And that feels like a much more tenable track than um, just doing a single wholesale channel. For yeah. sure. I mean, it's just like, biodiversity in any area. You don't yeah. want to count on one thing. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <say>. or all <laughs> your piglets. All your pigs in one pasture. <laughs> well, that's great. I um, That you found a more stable, well-balanced business and the farmer's market being part of that. So how many farmer's markets do you participate in and are they year-round or seasonal? Um, I was just looking at the numbers. I think we did about 25 to 28 roughly this year i think it was took a couple of days off for days when we had two weddings in the same day i was waiting for you to um, say good behavior <laughs> no we um we we participated in almost every um one of the farmers markets at steamboat landing which is the ithaca farmers market pavilion um and through the summer they do have a winter farmers market that we decided this year not to participate in um in person which is up at a an indoor space um but uh during the summer we're there as every weekend we can be and um 2019 was our first year there and we uh sold only hot food that year and it was just we were just doing a pig roast every week and serving barbecue sandwiches uh like three or four different sandwiches every week and so that's how we got started at the farmer's market and then it evolved in that following year into well actually at the end of 2019 we started processing in our commercial kitchen and doing uh, more you know packaged products and butchering Interesting. That, yeah. Starting with hot food and going going the other way. That's an interesting transition. Yeah, that's usually kind of see it the other way where people that are selling, you know, uncooked stuff to take home and cook themselves, they'll kind of convert those customers by giving them a little taste. And value added. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So um, how how did you decide to start doing that? Did Was it like people tasted your hot food and was like, yay, this is really delicious. I'd love to, you know get some of your meat to take home or how did you make that decision? Um, so I guess I, um, we got very lucky that I had started uh, very casually doing pig roasts a number of years before um, the original, the wholesale version of the business had, had ended. And so I had had a, you know, a little bit of a casual following in the community around the pig roast that we did, we do a couple times a year. And then I started 
doing a handful of friends weddings and you know scaling it up a little bit and um, again very not thinking of it as a financial venture at that point but I already had that track record going into that transition year and so um, that allowed us to focus on that as our primary outlet for the that first year or two and then I just knew that I wanted to expand the, I guess, mainly my skill set, but also like our product offerings around barbecue and smoked sausages and, um, and bacon, et cetera. And so it was, it was a, another pivot that we, we made um, later on, but it was, um, yeah, it was just out of an interest in trying to ex- expand what we were doing. I think that's so smart. Yeah, really smart. You know what? You keep saying we. Is that the royal we that you use when you own a business? <laughs> or um, do you have a big team? What kind of team do you have working with you? I, yeah, I, it's funny. I, I've, people have noted that before. I say we. I do I, that. <laughs> I don't like to, to speak about it just as a as sole proprietor and individual. I mean, I, I do a lot of the work and I've I pushed the the ball forward for a lot of years, but um, certainly I rely on a team of people and my mother has been, you know, a heavy supporter over the years and Tracy now is like uh, as close as you could be to a partner in, in the process. And, um, and yeah, so I don't have a family per se that I'm talking about and, and it's, it's primarily myself as the owner of the business, but, um, but yeah, I do like to think about the, the team that, we all put into this together and, and all bear responsibility for what, we, what we're working on. That's great. Yeah, I'm curious when we get to talking a little bit more about catering, whether you have chef tendencies or if you hired a chef to do menu development and, um, and cooking and things. Yeah, um, I mean, I can talk more about it later. But yeah, we, we do have a chef that we hired this year and he will be coming back next year as a, a more full-time um, employee. And he was uh, probably in the 25 or 30 hours a week this year, but this year, this uh, in 2022, he's going to be closer to 40. And um, and yeah, so I don't think of myself per se as a chef. I I don't think I've reached that um, that skill level yet. Um, we were interestingly talking about this uh, distinction uh, in the kitchen a few months ago, and. And I think a chef is somebody that you can hand pretty much any recipe and that they can perform and, and pull that recipe off. Um, and I, I'm not definitely not there yet. I came into this with a, an, an interest in, in me and uh, a real passion for working with animals. I, um, when I was young, I got a lot of experiences working around and with animals. And so I think that has carried me through and it's what has developed into my farm operation. But Um, I am not a culinary, uh, you know, expert by any means. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. All right. We'll get more to the catering in a second, but a couple more questions about the farmer's market. Um, One tricky part that we've noticed as farmer's market operators over the years is that selling meat at the market can be really tricky just because of the display, because you have to keep it cold. You have to, you know, keep it inside a refrigerator, but people that are shopping at the farmer's market do want to see product. Um, so how do you set up your stall to let your shoppers see your product or, you know, all of your branding looks really nice and your food looks, your hot food looks delicious. So how do you set up your display for your take-home products? Um, I would say like the first, um, part of our branding that I think is stuck with us through, through time is it's very colorful. And, um, that really comes from my mother who is a, um, an artist and uses lots of, lots of colors and abstract art, um, artistic kind of frameworks in her, in her work. So, um, she is the one that designed our logo and that really stands out. It's a, it's a rainbow colored pig. And so we use a lot of colorful tablecloths and I have like a kind of a tropical theme going on with mangoes and, and it's kind of relates to my Florida background I think it's, um, so it's a little bit bright and that's maybe the first thing that stands out but then um, Tracy has also done Tracy McAvely who I referred to as a partner in this business um, she has done a lot of great branding with our with our labeling and our menu designs and um, 
has made, uh, yeah, our, our chalkboards and everything else stand out in a really great way that uh, I think is a second layer of bringing people in. And and then maybe the, the third thing that happens at our stand that is um, a draw is that, you know, we, you know, present as a kitchen. We don't present as a butcher shop. So um, people come up, they see us cooking, they see us making uh, sausage rolls and we've got, you know, bright colored uh, kraut on there or slaws and chimichurri sauce. And, um, and so that draw along with some sampling that we do with our sausages really brings people to the table. And, and it, you can tell that that look people get, they look over briefly and then all of a sudden they're in front of you talking to you. So um, it's been a, the sampling especially has been a major, um, had a major impact on conversion from a looker to a, a purchaser. Yeah, that sounds really delicious. I'm it does sound really. delicious. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have to have different permits to sell pork chops versus the hot food in your area? Um, so the way it works in New York is uh, I can be a health department certified kitchen through the county or I could be a 20C um, production kitchen certified by Department of Ag and Markets. And the distinction is if more than 50% of my revenue comes from um, packaged products, then I would have to be a 20C kitchen through Ag and Markets. If more than 50% is through prepared foods and catering, which is primarily what our business is, um, then I'm a health department kitchen. So no, we, we're able to essentially operate as a restaurant and caterer and, and restaurants, you know, are allowed to buy in meat and process it and make a product out of it just like anybody else. And so, um, you're just buying it from yourself. That, yeah. Yeah. And so we just have the one health department license that allows us to do both catering and packaged food. Great. Yeah. It's a nice, yeah. that's a nice convenience. Not yeah. true in every state, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So, um, before we move on to catering events, just because you've kind of done a little bit of everything, what advice would you give to a farmer or rancher um, that has done primarily wholesale and is thinking about doing farmer's markets or is curious about the flexibility that farmer's market might bring to their business? Well, I I, I did write some ideas down on this, and I I think it sounds maybe a little funky, but I guess this, it's this very simple thing of like make friends with folks. And that means both your customers and, and other vendors. And um, I think that it's critical if you've been a wholesale farmer and you're used to staying on the farm and you're not, um, you know, marketing and branding your products regularly and trying to put your face out there. Um, it's, it's an important like, uh, you know, transition of, of personality and, and uh, how you spend your time and, and networking is really crucial, especially at least in our community. I don't know, you know, in other regions how it exactly works, but at least in the Finger Lakes, it's a very strong networked uh, local farm community. And, and so it's important that you, you know, reach out to other farmers and vendors there and, you know, walk by their stand, check out what they're doing, um, and stay involved in that way. Um, and then the other thing that stands out to me is um, a, a big piece of our recipe is that uh, I really have leaned on Tracy in a number of ways to to do the things that I was not able to spend time doing. Um, I'm running the farm. Um, you know, it's not a significant load on my time because I you know, have a skid steer and I can feed animals and water them pretty re- readily. It's not terribly um, onerous, but, but there's just a number of things happening on my end of things that if I wanted to grow the business, I really needed somebody else that was a, had a, um, a design sense and was able to pull off some of the activities and tasks that I, I didn't have that focus to do I probably could have if I had spent tons of time thinking about it and working it through but um spending a, I've you know at first it felt like a lot of money it felt like wow there's a lot of money going out the door to to design these menus or to design this ad for something or whatever it is uh, that all has well paid itself off I mean and in addition I would say spending some money on our website felt you know a couple thousand dollars in those early years felt like a lot, but it's 
it's by far been some of the best investments we've made. Interesting. Your website yeah. is really nice, actually. Yeah. yeah. It was very easy to navigate I was, <laughs> as I was looking at your business. So Yeah, you could tell somebody really thought that through and then it, it functions well. Yeah. So given that you're doing all these different things, how do you balance your time between actually farming? Are you personally at the farmer's markets? Um, are you at the catering events and pig roasts? And then we'll talk a little bit about how you manage the CSA as well. Yeah, um, I'm at all of those things. Um, <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it is kind of crazy making. Um, I, again, I'm lucky enough to be um, a single um, guy with no no kids. And so financially and time-wise, more importantly, really, I, I have so much flexibility. That's uh, certainly a key to sustaining what I'm doing. I, I've envisioned... Um, actually adopting maybe in the next few years. And, and I think it's going to require a lot of, of uh, careful consideration around my time management because right now I'm kind of all in on the business. Um, and yeah, so the answer is I'm on the farm daily. Um, and I do have a couple people that pitch in here and there, you know, cash free pigs with me or, um, you know, maybe take care of a day or two of, of farm chores here and there. But um for the most part, it's been on me, and um, and I'm also at farmers market almost every week. I, I there's there's some times where we do have uh, wedding events, and I'm off doing the wedding, and so we have somebody fill in. But um, that's definitely less common. Um, so every Saturday throughout the you know the height of the season, from essentially April through October, I've got something to do on Saturday every week, and and so. That means, you know, my work week is really from Tuesday through Sunday. And um, and so, yeah, that, that's how it yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah, it's pretty common, I think, in farming and certainly in farmers markets, that sort of Tuesday through Sunday thing. You know, we do have farmers that have really large families just so that they can supply farm hands at a reasonable <laughs> price. I'm, I'm not sure if really it pencils out financially to raise a child to work on the farm. but no. uh, I don't know if an adoption agency would like right, that yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah. 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 So why do you want a kid? Well, don't mention that when you go. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, how about the CSA? Uh, do you have any tricks or tips about managing a CSA and, and making your time work the best for that? Um, I, I, we are only in the beginnings of our second year running this CSA program. Um, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, say that we figured it out by any means. Uh, I definitely had the experience that um, I was dropping off at three different um, vegetable CSA drop-off locations, as well as um, at this place called Press Bay Alley, where there's a food hub. And um, I was also doing some home deliveries. And that extent of having five, essentially five different pickup times and locations was a bit crazy making. And we felt the need to do it this first year as a way to get uh, the word out and get outreach and get customers. But um, the goal that we're working towards this year is to refine the number of locations and drop off times um, so that, that it doesn't require so much kind of transportation and time and costs. Um, and um, but, you know, I don't know if I have any exactly keys of wisdom on the CSA yet. It's still a, a work in progress. It definitely has been successful. We were shooting for 30 members on average for our first um two sessions and we we accomplished that um but i think the the key is trying especially with meat because it's a perish well i mean produce is as well but uh meat is especially perishable and people don't want to lose that value so it's really important that you manage the simplicity of the csa in a way that works for you um and don't let it get overly complicated uh with a bunch of different types of meats or or weird pickup times that end up costing, causing, causing you difficulty. What are you including in your CSA? Is it more pork chops and bacon and sausage, or do you have the cured items and, and that kind of thing in there as well? Um, we, we definitely, it's across the board. Um, we try to make it a, a nice variety, uh, and one guarantee of sorts that we make is that there will always be one type of bacon and, and one type of sausage in every. <laughs> I mean, that's enough bun. for me. Right? <laughs> that is an important promise. <laughs> it is an important. I mean, yeah. what's hard about selling bacon? 
So to talk a little bit, I mean, one of the wonderful things that you're doing is that you're involved with training new farmers because that's a challenge for us consumers as eaters, people that yeah. need food to keep coming, and certainly as farmer's market operators and participants. Uh, I think the biggest challenge always in terms of farmer's markets is lots of communities would like to see us open new markets. We only have so many farmers, and those farmers can only stretch to so many locations and so many hours a week at markets. So anything that anybody's doing to bring new farmers into the fold is great. Um, you said that you actually got some training at Groundswell before you joined the staff there. Is that true? Well, it, it, they were kind of uh, overlapping, the one and the same. So in 2011, I um, started with Groundswell. I believe that year, if I'm recalling correctly, 2011 was mostly a volunteer year. Um, and at some point in 2011, I th- want to say in the later part, I was actually hired as the incubator program manager. and um, that was my title for six years, roughly. And um, so, yeah, my focus through Groundswell was on launching this incubation program, again, which which came out of an interest of working with the Intervale Center uh, in Burlington, which was one of the original incubation programs. And, um, you know, I, I really felt at that point that, uh, as I think many of us know now, is that it's it's such an important key to making sure that the next generation is getting access to the land and to agricultural resources broadly, um, and so that was that was why I was excited. And and yes, while I was also working at Groundswell, I was also able to attend a lot of the training programs, meet a lot of the farmers, walk their farms, see their operations, and um, that was really the exposure that got me interested in in becoming a operating farmer. Do they, so are the classes there mainly working with brand new farmers or is it existing farmers that are coming in trying to transition to a different kind of operation or do all of that? Um, no, definitely exploring and um, we call it aspiring, exploring and beginning farmers. Uh, really the main categories. The, the existing farmers in the community, there was a number of, of young um you know, kind of CSA focused often farmers that were of the last generation of sorts that were the mentors for our programs. And, and we, you know, we still work with many of them. Um, and, and they were just such, uh, such valuable assets for Groundswell and for Tompkins County and the community at large. I mean, um, yeah, so, so we really leaned on them as the mentors for the programs. We did not do a lot of training for existing farmers to transition. Um, but that, you know, to me, that was the most exciting space of the, of the new farming kind of movement at that point was, was these young, young farmers, or in some cases, refugee farmers, uh, which is actually what the incubator program became focused on, was uh, the refugee, the Burmese population in Ithaca that had resettled here for the past decade or so. And um, there are many Karen, ethnically Karen refugees and, and we found out that they had not only huge farming expertise, but a desire and really wanted to get started again. And so that was an opportunity to kind of um, meet some, some of our social justice missions um, around changing the face of farming. Um, but also work with people that were really gung ho and and ready to get started. So. Yeah, that's amazing. And are you working mostly with young people? Or are you seeing midlife kind of career change folks? I would say a good mix. Um, there are a lot of young people, um, especially in the most recent program that Groundswell run the ran the farmer training program we ran in twenty twenty one was primarily. I, I don't know exactly the age frame. I wouldn't want to say, but they were younger. I would say. Um, the incubator program supported uh, a broader spectrum of age ranges, um, but uh, yeah, not terribly amount, a uh, terrible large amount of um, older folks necessarily joining it. Mostly, I would say under fifty. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that we're still considered young under fifty. So it's, <laughs> yes, um, I am not. I'm like <laughs> either young or under fifty, but uh, but most of our team is, so that's good. Uh, what What do you see the biggest issues are facing farmers in your area as far as new farmers? Um, I, I 
hate to look at things from too cynical or systemic a lens, but I definitely have long felt that market opportunities are the the missing piece often to our puzzle. I mean, we certainly have a, a lack, we, we're lacking in agricultural resources and land and access to financing and, um, and, and the knowledge as well. But I think at the end of the day, the thing that concerns me the most is industrial food in comparison to small scale farming and localized food systems. Um, especially when the economy is bad and, and folks have less disposable income, less ability to pay up for a, a higher quality, a localized product. I think we see increasingly, um, you know, small farms are not as competitive in that marketplace when, especially in, in terms of meat, I find that to be uh, a real concern is that industrialized meat has priced us out of business in a sense. And, and we also, which coincides with this is, is a lot of the small farmers have to kind of cater to the highest bidder and we are not able to make it uh, widely affordable and accessible, especially um, across class and race. And, um, and so I find that to be like the ongoing story of small farming in America right now is that um, we just can't, we can't make enough money through the markets that we have available to us to um, stay in business in a lot of cases. And especially for the most, the most fresh and new farmers, it's very hard to find some of those market opportunities and even get started in the first place. So, um, I mean, there's, there's a number of other issues, as I mentioned, um, uh, you know, rising costs uh, in comparison with those price points that we're able to access, like, we're beginning squeezed from a number of different angles, but I, I do see that market opportunities is, is one of the missing pieces that has been really, really difficult to solve nationally and, and in the Finger Lakes for sure. Yeah, I I mean, we like to think we're helping that a little bit in terms of the farmer's market industry because we do supply the, the opportunity, of course, to keep the retail price of your product. So more farmer's markets is a good thing. On the other hand, mm-hmm. you know, it's definitely becomes a classist thing where yeah. if you're charging the real price of what it costs to prepare food without the subsidies and things that industrialized producers get, it becomes very difficult to make your product available to all the people that could take advantage of it and, and could be eating better and, and be served more nutritionally by, by that happening. So I guess um, in addition to farmers markets, we need to remember to keep in touch with people on the policymaking level and look at – either leveling the playing field by eliminating you know, the subsidies for the industrialized food or uh, providing those same subsidies to small farmers and to people that are doing good things and bringing good things to consumers. Yeah, I, I think an example um, which I would like to see more widely spread is the um, payment through health insurance plans for CSA shares. Um, I know that there is a program, and I'm forgetting the name, um, it's called Share or something like that in Michigan that has has made that widely accessible um, and and so yeah just as even just as a, a possible example I don't think it's you know widely used but I think as a policy tool that is a great opportunity for for folks and some of the institutional buying programs in New York have definitely um, leveraged some of the small farmers and and expanded their capacities. Um, so that's really promising as well, but that's definitely, it's spotty and, and not a holistic solution to the issues that we're facing. So, Yeah, tough stuff. Um, so in between running your CSA on the farmer's market and catering things, if you go ahead and run for office, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> you can have our boat. That's right. <laughs> really nice talking to you today, Devin. You've, uh, you're doing a lot, it sounds like. You're, you're keeping your thumb in a lot of places, and diversity, we think, is the key to healthy businesses. Uh, good food is the key to good health, and we appreciate all the things you're doing to contribute to all of that. Well, thank you guys for having me, and um, yeah, good luck out there. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for being with us. Have a Happy good one. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening today, and big thanks to American Farmland Trust for protecting small farmers and supporting Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market podcast. Click their logo on the resource page at farmersmarketpros.com and join today. Your membership makes a difference. 
Farmers markets are all about connection, and all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. Join us and your fellow market participants at the 6th Annual Intense the Farmers Market Conference in San Diego, California on March 7th, 8th, and 9th, 2022 to grow your market and your community. Connect with people just like you from various parts of the country and share what's happening in your area in the terrific conversations over in our private Facebook group, the Farmers Market Pros Community. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmers Market Pros or email us at connect at farmersmarketpros.com. Thanks for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcast, and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. If you are listening on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is proudly produced by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll have another great episode next week. Tune in.